Good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. And uh, thank you very much for coming today for, to this uh, press conference. Um, I've got a, a couple of housekeeping things to mention first. If we, um, if you could all remember to put your phones on mute, um, or otherwise keep them quiet, <laughs> uh, to save interruptions. Um, and uh, we also need to keep these uh, spaces here clear, just so there's proper shots for the colleagues with cameras at the back there. <clears throat> So, uh, Tuesday next week, June 4, will mark 30 years since China's military opened fire on unarmed demonstrators in Tiananmen Square in Beijing. It's still not known how many people uh, were killed or injured on that day. Of course, many of them were students uh, because there's been no um, credible independent investigation of what happened. Um, today, we do, we do, though, have two speakers who were directly involved in the Tiananmen protests in 1989 and subsequently faced punishment and exile by China. Uh, they're here today to honor those um, that lost their lives, uh, as well as many more that faced subsequent punishment and imprisonment um, by China's government. Um, our first speaker today, uh, Mr. Hu Ping, is a commentator on Radio Free Asia and heads the Chinese Alliance for Democracy. Our second speaker, Mr. Wang Dan, now heads Dialogue China, which is a US-based uh, think tank. Uh, Mr. Hu will speak first. Um, they've also advised me that their comments will be really quite short. They want to give just a five or ten minute introduction each, a short commentary, uh, because they do want to open up uh, for Q&A as much, to allow as much time as we can. So, um, if you could just join me again in welcoming our guests here today. Thank you. Mr. Hu. Thank you. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. This year is 13th anniversary of June 4th massacre. 30 years, 30 years ago, a large-scale democratic movement was launched in China. The movement convincingly proved that in China, freedom and democracy were not only the pursuit of a very small number of dissidents, but were the common aspiration of millions of ordinary people. The protesters set up a statue of democracy in Tiananmen Square, apparently modeled after the American Statue of Liberty. At that time, everyone was convinced that the freedom and the democracy were universal value, not only applicable to the West, but also to China. Next, the Berlin Wall collapsed, and the Soviet Union and the East, East Europe changed dramatically. The United States became the only superpower in the world, and the democracies saw its greatest victory in history. At that time, it was widely believed that the CCP regime, <clears throat> the CCP regime's days were numbered. However, 30 years later, the CCP regime has not collapsed. In fact, it stands firm and has become stronger than before. Contrary to many people's expectation, the CCP has not in initiated any political reform. <clears throat> it has not become softer and more tolerant because of its greatest economic success. 
especially since Xi Jinping took office. The CCP regime has become more and more aggressive. Meanwhile, it seems that democracies, including America, are encountering a lot of trouble. In just 30 years, we have witnessed the huge reversal in the world that has been extremely rare in the human history. <clears throat> Looking back the history, we can see that the June 4th was the turning point. The June 4th massacre not only ended China's democratization process, but also led China's economic re reform down a wrong path. Because of June 4th, democratic force in China were suppressed, and the, economic, and the economic reforms have since been carried out without democratic participation and the public supervision. Therefore, it became a, a privatization by the members of the Communist <coughs> Party themselves. CCP officials, in the name of reform, turned public assets into their own private property, therefore making China's privatization process a single step designation. <clears throat> As we know, the CCP rose to power by toppling landlords and the capitalists. But now, it has become the biggest landlord and the capitalist itself. First, in the name of a revolution, it turned the private property of common people into the public property of the people as a whole. Now, in the name of reform, it has turned the public property of the people as a whole into the private property of its own members. First, it plundered in the name of revolution, and now it divided the spoil in the name of reform. These two opposite crimes were both committed by one and the same party in the space of 17 years. Has the world ever seen anything more shameless? But ironically, ironically <clears throat> also China's privatization was morally the most shameless. It was economically the most effective. Inspired by the capitalist mechanism, China's economy grew rapidly. In addition, China took the global express train, attracting international capital and advanced techno technology with an with an advantage of low wages and the low social welfare overhead based on disregard for human rights. Thus, it becomes the most predatory form of capitalism, which enjoined the strongest global competitiveness. Hence, there come to be so-called Chinese model and also the Chinese miracle. However, the lack of legitimacy of, is fatal to China's economy reform and the development. The so-called Chinese model started after the massacre of June 4th is based on injustice. It is in, essentially a process of open robbery. The deeper such a process goes, the more unwilling the CCP, the CCP regime will be to implement any political reform. Therefore, it must be confidently all-powerful regime that is contempt contemptuous and, uh, <clears throat> and hostile to human rights, democracy, and justice. Such a regime that's necessarily a threat to the freedom and the peace of mankind. This threat will only become more serious and dangerous 
over time. Democratic forces all the, all the world should know <clears> that China's problem is not only China's, but also the world. And they should urgently unite to, prom to, promote, to promote an end of the CCP regime, one part dictatorship, and China's transformation to democracy while there is still time. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mr. Hood. So uh, Mr. Wang Dan will now speak. Okay. <clears throat> thank you for inviting me here. It's not first time. I mean, third or fourth time here. So many old friends I can recognize the face. And uh, thanks, Peter, for moderating this. I actually have uh, pretty much the same opinions with Mr. Hu, but I have my obligation, so I have to say something. Um, I think it's very important today to remember what happened in Tiananmen Square 30 years ago, not only because we were victim, Tiananmen veterans, just because the whole world, I think that we, we come here for the sake of the whole world because I think it's the time to re-recognize the true face of China. What lesson we can learn from what happened in 13 years. That's the point I want made. I still remember when I was 20 years old, when I was young, and uh, we went to the street, we protest. I have to admit we were naive. Why? Because we put a hope on CCP. That's the reason, that's maybe the only reason we go to the street. We, do not, we did not want to take responsibility to change the world, change the country, but we put our hope on the CCP, and we hope they can change the country. That's why we went to the street, and we were naive after the massacre. And we realized that from that massacre that this democracy is the enemy of the CCP. Whatever they open and reform, and look like uh, liberal leaders, but if you want a democracy, you will be enemy of state, enemy of state. That's the true CCP. But it's only us naive at that time. I think the whole world, not only us, the whole world was naive at that time. After that bloody massacre, the whole Western countries put a sanction on China, including, including Japan. But remember, after only two years, they all uh, called it off the sanction. They withdrew the sanction. Why? Because it's still Western countries and the Japan government still have hope for CCP as naive as us. They believe with cooperation or engagement with China, maybe China will have a rapid economic growth, then they will have a middle class, then there's democracy. But after 30 years, we all realize it's so naive. It's not only us naive, it's the whole world naive. So my question is, is it time for us now, for the whole democratic countries now to re-recognize the true face of CCP and try to learn some lessons from Tiananmen massacre. And this is a very important challenge for the whole world because now China is a rising power and uh, seems like a threat for the democracy and the freedom of the whole world. So this is very important to remember what happened in Tiananmen Square 30 years ago. So well, I don't need to give answer to government. It's the government's responsibility to try to learn some lesson from their uh, relationship with China 30 years ago. But uh, my next question is, now after 30 years, China become a powerful country. I have a lot of money and uh, the, the, the huge military force and that's right for democratic countries. How can we solve this problem? I, we already say there's a trade war between the United States and China. Maybe in the future there are more troubles. I think China, CCP become a troublemaker for the whole world. But how can we deal with this troublemaker? 
I still remember when I was arrested after the Tiananmen massacre. I was arrested twice, actually. It's an interesting experience. Um, but I was arrested twice and served my term twice in jail. Finally, I was released to the United States. Uh, I, I didn't die in the jail. Why? Because there's, but because I'm kind of like a panda, you know. So if China want to try to get something from the United States, then they, tr they treat me to the United States, then President Clinton can visit Beijing. At that time, there's a link between trade, between trade and economic issue and the human rights issues, and that's why I can be released. And you remember Liu Xiaobo? He's even Nobel Prize winner, and he died in jail. Why? Because there's no link between trade and human rights issues. So now China become a threat for freedom world. And uh, in my opinion, I think it is time to relink trade and human rights issues. That might be the only way to deal with this problem. And uh, I know a lot of Western countries they don't want to ruin their relationship with China. And they don't want to see any regime change happen in China. But I have to say, if there's no regime change, nothing can be resolved. That's my point. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. We'll open the floor now to questions from the media first, um, please, um, if you can give your name and affiliation and also make clear who you're addressing your question to, be most appreciated. I think I will take the first question if you don't mind. Um, uh, to Mr. Wang, you said that delinking trade from human rights. So, could you comment on the the approach of the current U.S. administration and how it's it's dealing with China in terms of trade sanctions? Are you saying that there should be an entirely separate channel of communications with China on human rights? No, no, no. That's not what I mean. I mean. Um, what I mean the, the relink the trade and the human rights issue, what I mean is you have to put some human rights issues in the list of a trade negotiation. Uh, as a all think tank dialogue, China, we located in Washington, we worked with other think tanks and organizations. We already provide our suggestion to White House and the Congress, and our suggestion is very simple. Why there's trade war between United, United States and China? Why there's trade unbalance between these two countries? There's two reasons. One reason is the salary is too, low, too low. I mean, for those workers, workers too low. Then the product <coughs> made in China can be so cheap. That is the basic reason of the, the, the economic unbalance. So why don't you put the issue like uh, the human right of labor? in your talk with China. This one suggestion. Another is the, the internet. The block of the internet harmed a lot of benefit of American companies. Why don't the US government never put these issues on the table? So if you put this table, these are all human rights issues. I mean, the labor right and, uh, or, and the, the, the freedom of uh, internet. If U.S. government can involve these two issues into their uh, uh, trade talk, I think that's the relink. You don't have to pass a bill. You can just use this way to relink trade and trade and human rights. And it will be welcomed by the Chinese people because that's a, this is beneficial for Chinese people. That's, that's our suggestion. Mr. Hu, do you have any comment on that? No, no response. Well, well Trump just left. Maybe <laughs> if he's here, I can ask him. But he left. Sorry. No. <laughs> bad. I, I met Mr. Hu here. Actually, did he have any comment uh, on that? Well, I'll add one point. Is, um, the West in China dealing with China, uh, economic relations, should emphasize the human rights standard. Um, spreading this information to the Chinese population will be a great benefit. 
这个对于中共当局要煽动那种所谓民族主义，呃呃这个。反对这个反对这个自由世界，其实有很大的帮助。呃，如果很广大的中国人民知道啊、呃、这场贸易战或者这种贸易纠纷啊、呃，那么实际上对他们自改善自身的处境是有利的。我想他们就不会对中共的种种的错误做法再支再采取支持的态度。I think the <coughs> I think uh, when Western trade uh, doing trade, Western country doing trade with China, um, Western country should emphasize human right while they doing the trade with China, with the, while they starting the trading war with China, and once the Chinese people know that the trading war is they are they are going to benefit from the trading war. Then the the Chinese people will not uh, just uh, believe what the Chinese government has said, uh, so they will be more welcome. The Western uh, they will be more supportive for the trading trading war. One more point is um, why White House and the Congress ignored our suggestion just because, as I said before, they do not want regime change. Happen in China. Even they know CCP is not their friend, and they did ugly things 30 years ago. The Western countries still want to redeem change. I think it's ridiculous. Okay. Any yes at uh, the back? If anyone else has questions, please, if you could raise your hand, let me know. Hi, uh, thank you very much. I'm Kenji Kawase from Nikkei. Um, first of all, my question is to Mr. Wandan. Uh, okay. uh, 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 okay. Some people okay. 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 right. okay. My question is, okay, okay. The, the, question, the biggest question is how? The regime change, how? How do, how do you deal with? The issue of how is very important, I guess, uh, as you've experienced in the past 30 years. Pretty much nothing has happened. It went to the other direction of what you have been trying to to pursue. So, uh, and and also not only among the uh, the people that China has created the big camp and the the authoritarian camp within the the democracy camp. There's a, a huge range of differences. Uh, United States, maybe U.S. Congress, may be very uh, uh, be willing. To, to force, to push forward uh, regime change, but maybe not here in Japan. Um, so the, the question of how, um, especially after 30 years of going the other directions, that is my, my first question to, to Mr. Wandan. And uh, another one to, uh, to both of you, actually, uh, is to, um, th this, this is like a personal question. Don't you uh, sort of get, Tired of talking about the same thing for the past 30 years and nothing happens, it actually goes to the other way. Um, because it, uh, it seems like uh, if there's like a progress, I think you're able to like push it through. But now that you don't have anything, actually, uh, your your uh, your enemy has uh, has grown to that that magnitude. And uh, it's giving a, you use the word monster in Taipei. If you, I was there at the conf three day conference. Uh, it's already created a monster. And uh, which uh, is very, very hard. To, this is connected to the first question. So please tell us your personal uh, opinion of, uh, of how you feel, uh, how you felt the past 30 years, and, and how are you going to uh, push forward for the next, th I don't know, 30 years? Thank you. How would you like to answer those? OK. OK. Um, well, first question I already answered, actually. I think reading a trade that issue and the human rights issues will be very influential. So what happened in the Soviet Union, there's a lot of this kind of pressure from international community. And I think those international pressures worked. If that worked on Soviet Union's case, why, uh, I believe it also will work on China's case. I mean, some international interfere like link trade and human rights issues, or the higher voice 
uh, to advocate uh, democracy in, in China. And uh, it's not global time, so I think international community can do something. But I do think uh, if you want regime change happen in China, the, the, the Chinese people take the biggest responsibility. But if China democracy or not, it's also related to the benefit of Western countries. And you have to do something. It's not only us, not only concerned to us, it's also concerned to yours. Um, Secondly, I think United is very important, just like you said. Uh, CCP tried many ways to try to spread uh, uh, Euro European countries and the United States. So the, and Australia, Japan, uh, England, Germany, and the United States work together is very important. It's not time to fight each other. You have a bigger enemy. This is my second suggestion. From my personal Readers, no, I, yes, I'm really tired, of course. I'm 50 years old. To do anything, I feel tired. <laughs> Even eat a lunch, I feel tired. But, but this is my obligation. I have to do this. I have to take this responsibility. It's one reason. And the second reason, is, well, just like you said, the, the CCP become even bigger. We, I, I admit, I actually cannot see big hope in the near future. But I think what we are doing not only for overthrow a dictatorship, it's also for our self-respectation, for dignity of human being. Keep on doing something right is something we have to do, no matter what happens as a result. So for this reason, I will never give up. Uh, Mr. Hu. Uh, 当然就是三十年来一直在谈同样一个问题让人难免会让产生厌倦所以六四我谈的刚才谈到一个主题Of course, talking the, about the same topic for 30 years, it, it is boring. However, I think it is still, we still should talk about it, continue to talk about it. Because just like what I said, the June 4 massacre and uh, today's China's problem is not the, a few numbers of the dissidents topic and problem. It is the world's topic. It should be world's problem and world's topic. So, so I think after the 30 years today, especially we should talk about this because this China's rights has become has threatened the world and we the, the whole world should be alert should be aware of this problem. Otherwise, it's it's, it will be imaginable what is, what is going to happen, what is going to be happen after next 30 years. Thank you. Any other questions from the floor? If not, I have another question. Mm -hmm. uh, we had um, a two academics, Chinese academics, come and speak here at the club, uh, I think a year or two ago. And one of them said something that very much interested me. He said that the biggest fear for uh, Beijing's current leadership, the leadership of the Communist Party, the thing that keeps them awake every night is Chinese nationalism and the fear of nationalism. So he gave an example of, um, there was recently the, uh, um, the shutdown of a number of South Korean stores because South Korea had agreed to place US missile batteries um, that can supposedly um, be in range of China. And it creates a lot of street protests and so on. And he said this kind of thing 
was very much what the, the government feared, that once that's out on the streets, the protests again, the, it could get out of control. Do you have any thoughts on that or views or comment? Is it nationalism that they fear most? Um, first of all, is there any real nationalism in China? I really doubt it. Right? If you, if there's a strong nationalistic favor in young generation, how can you explain why so many people left China? Especially those young generations. What kind of nationalism this is? So maybe we, yeah, academic term, maybe we need to use another term, but I think in the traditional definition of nationalism is, you cannot use this word to explain the reality of China. But it's more academic, let me back to reality. I think, yeah, yes, I admit and agree that nationalism, uh, the CCP and Xi Jinping really want to wave the flag of nationalism, but it's really dangerous for them. Because any time if there are people over thousands, they get together in the street, it's really a threat. It's really a danger. Even I think it's, it's a danger for the, for the government. So, on the one hand, they want to use nationalistic favor, but on the other hand, they do not want to see hundreds of people get together. They put themselves in this trap. I think the United States has a I also think the government and the outside world exaggerate that what, the, what, what they said, the nation, nationalism in China, is, is an exaggerate. 因为据我们所了解包括你看中国人前些年有很发生过好几起很强大的所谓反日本的风潮我们这几代中国人我们根本没有过受所谓西方啊包括日本帝国主义欺负的这种经验我们的生活经验只有大约近挨饿的经验呢文化革命浩劫的经验呢包括这六四的经验所以你看你不能想象一个民族他可以对我
something happened many many years, like a uh, Japan war, like a. Uh, um, especially Western war started with the 19th centuries. It's, it's, it's not possible people forget their real experience and only remember the, the ex, ex, remember, remember the things the books, the government taught you. It's, it's, it's ridiculous, it's impossible. Okay, thank you. Um, so. <clears throat> I'll also open the floor to anyone else who has any questions, any associate members or others, non-journalists. Oh, yeah. uh, Siegfried Niedel, freelancer from Germany. Uh, every time I thought uh, it's a kind of uh, feeling, uh, remembering that uh, China was colonized by the Western countries. I say, and uh, I, th I thought I, what I read sometimes is so China people still feel this kind of a, a humiliation by the foreign countries. And this is a reason to to uh, make China a very strong country. And this, I, I think this is a kind of a, the reason for a kind of uh, China nationalism. I think one, one example, I, every time I, uh, often I read example, what happened with uh, um, students in in Australia, perhaps. Uh, student, China students in Australia, they protest a lot against the Chinese government or, or the Chinese government, uh, uh, Australian government or Australian scholar, and uh, told, uh, told, uh, tell them every time to not, not uh, to, to talk against the Chinese, China government. So in sin, is, this, is this not a kind of a, a, a nationalism? Who is the question for, Siegfried? Bo both. When students in, in, this, in foreign countries react in this way, is this not a kind of a, a nationalism uh, for, uh, for, from these students? And is this not uh, a kind of a... But only the students think so, I think. Do not many uh, uh, Chinese people think in this way? Do, that, do they not have this feeling for humiliation to, and, and to want to have a strong China country again? Yeah, my, my point was, who is your question directed to? Is it Mr. Oh, Wang or Mr. Who? Uh, Mr. Uh, Wang. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Well, <coughs> as 30 years ago in, in Beijing, our generation had a real nationalistic feeling because we really want to do something for our country, make it better. That is a true nationalistic favor. But now, as a very big impact of Tiananmen massacre is make the whole generation of elite collectively give up their responsibility for this country. And that's why they left that country. Those middle class, intellectuals, young generations. So how can you imagine nationalism? If, if the whole elite class, they just want to leave this country, there's no room for any nationalism. That's my point. So I don't think, I even don't think there's nationalism in China at all. Mm.嗯.嗯.嗯.嗯.嗯.嗯.嗯.嗯.嗯.嗯.嗯.嗯.嗯.嗯.嗯.嗯.嗯.嗯.嗯.嗯.嗯.嗯.嗯.嗯.
what they should express, what kind of feeling they should express, what kind of emotion they should not express. 因此，你就可以看到，在有些时候，对有些话题，包括对某些西方国家，大家就很清楚，我们这个时候是可以表达对他们的反对，而且我们可以采取一些很激烈的行动。而同样类似的事情呢，啊，那么他他知道情况就不一样，我们就不能那么做。That's why you can see many Chinese people, even outside in overseas Chinese. They can do. Uh, they can have a very strong pause to Western government because they know they are they are safe to protest the Western government. But if same thing happened, if something happened same in China, they wouldn't say anything because they know they can't. They shouldn't. You just give an example. Just like now, many Chinese. 到外头旅游或者在别的国家定居，嗯，当他们和政府发生了一些问题的时候，嗯，如果他们是在了一个比较自由民、比较民主的政府，他们非常懂得怎么样利用这种民主权利去抗争，去和政府抗争。但同样的事情，呃，政府在中国，政府做的事情比他恶劣的多，但是他们不会做同样的事情，不会做同样的反应。When many Chinese people live over overseas. In democratic countries, once they encounter any problem, they know very well how to protest and how to use the democratic system to protect themselves. But if the same thing happened in China, even more serious things happened in China, then they wouldn't do anything. They would keep silent. 所以说，简单来说，我觉得现在中国不是很简、很单纯的、很天真的一种什么主义，什么或者民族主义，嗯、呃，而是在大部分事情上，呃，都过于的呃聪明，呃，过于的精明，呃，过于的机会主义。So that's why I think in China today is not some pure nationalism or simple. You can you can just this you cannot describe Chinese people as simple nationalism. What, in my opinion, Chinese people today is too smart, is too opportunistic. They they just use any chance to protect to protect themselves. That's it. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Jesse Johnson with the Japan Times. I have two quick questions for you. Uh, sorry, the first one is, um, given that the Communist Party has basically effectively erased the memory of Tiananmen, um, what can Japan do to help preserve the memory um, in the face of like patriotic education in China and the improving uh, Sino-Japanese relationship, what what can Japan do realistically to help bring um, the memory, keep the memory alive? Is the first question. So one by one, together. Second yeah, both both of you guys. Yes, please. Do you have a second question? Yeah, and the second question is, um, would would you say that you mentioned earlier Japan was one of the first countries to kind of invite? Uh, China back into the the fold after Tiananmen. Would you say? Would you assign at least some kind of partial blame to Japan for being so quick to have China come back after Tiananmen? That's to both gentlemen. Yes. Yeah. Whoever wishes prefer, to answer first. I prefer talk about the first question. Um, I think Japan can do a lot of things. Uh, we all know in, in the past, in the history, there's some, there's two, uh, there's some conflict between Japan and China. We cannot change that as history already happened. We have to make some new history. And I believe this new history must be based on, on a foundation of uh, democracy. I mean, uh, Japan has this responsibility to promote or help to promote democracy in China. But I know Japanese government is very realistic 
but I don't think it's, a, it's the right choice. Um, for details, well, there's a lot of things they can do, like United States, they have a, a national endorsement of democracy, a huge foundation, found a lot of uh, NGOs inside, inside China. It's very helpful for civil society's growth in China. So why don't you, why don't the Japan government do this? Even Taiwan has this kind of uh, uh, foundation to support civil development of civil society. So Japan can do this, I don't know, I don't understand why they do not want to do this. So. And secondly, there are a lot of uh, human rights abuse happened in China, including the, the tragic of death of Liu Xiaobo. But I never see Japanese government say something about this. You have to say something. It's not a very high requirement. I'm looking forward to it. <音>当如何保持记忆 it is important to keep the memory of June 4th. Actually, June 4th uh, massacre, uh, government crackdown student movement is not the first, uh, is not the first, and it will not the, be the last. Actually, June 4th massacre is not the most serious time the government uh, crash uh, democratic movement. It is just because it, June 4th happened in front of the TVs all over the world, so it become a most important thing. Mm -hmm. 其实你从六四这件事就可以说看出现在中国人很多问题。参加过八九名的人是这个遍地都是，但是你要问现在的中国人，很多人对六四就就根本就不清楚，根本就不了解。呃，你说在国内他们受到消息的封锁，他们到了自由的海外，他们对这个事情也不太关心。嗯。
I would not just know it. <coughs> 另外，他你要说像中国，他完全不知道这件事情，像六四的事情，他也不是这个样子的。呃，政府也并不是希望大家真正的都不知道六四的事情。实际上，大家还是很清、很牢牢地记住六四所造成的那种恐惧，这个是非常深的，留在每一个中国人的心里。China's, in my opinion, the the most important thing is the fear. June massacres fear, June Fourth massacres fear, is still stay in every Chinese's mind. That that's that's very heavy for every Chinese. 你这个，呃，如果你在座有人曾经在八九年就六四之前去过中国，对当时的中国有了解，就知道当时中国人的整整的整个的大部分那种，呃。那种心理、那种状态是非常积极、非常活跃的，在政治上是非常关心的。而当时有句话话嘛，就是说的，这现在世界上谁也不怕谁。那时候的人们对政府根本没有畏惧的心理。而六四之后呢，那么就重新加加重了对政府的恐惧。所以你要说今天中中国人民不是不知道六四，六四所所造成的恐惧。这个使得中国人在六四之后的人们的心态和六四之前有了非常大的区别。If you, uh, if you uh, ever uh, visit China before the June 4 mass massacres, you should know that at that time, during that time, Chinese people has full of hope for Western, for Western system, for the democracy, for freedom. They, are, they were very happy at that time. They, and, and you should know that no one at that time is afraid of the government. They, they, they go to the street, they protest. They are not afraid of the government. They full of hope in their, in their heart, excuse me. However, today, people, the June 4 massacre made the people have a lot of fear inside. They, you cannot say they don't know June 4th at all. No. The, today, the information is so open, they should know. And they have the opportunity to know. But they don't want to know, because the fear stop them to know. Once, why people want to keep the fear inside? Why, why, if they if they already so afraid of the government, how one how how come they want to know the truth and to make themselves feel so bad every day? Is is there any follow on that, Jesse? Is that fine? Neither uh, of you answered the second question. I'm curious. Personal feelings. Oh, well, uh, what's the second? Uh, I already forget. Me too. Why? 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 And Japan has the, actually the biggest responsibility for the peace of uh, East Asia. So, so I, that's why, I, of course, I'm, I, can't, I, I can't agree with Japan government, government's decision at that time. Uh, Mr. Hu, do you have any additional comment on that? <音>我想这个，我们都有同样的、同样的感觉。呃，当初刘晓波还活着的时候，他就十年前他就写过文章，对西方包括日本的这种所谓绥靖主义有过很严厉的批评。Yeah, I agree. I agree with Wang Dan. Ten years ago, even Liu Xiaobo write article, um, and show his disappointed with the Western community. 但是我想，在很多人也可以理解，因为今天中国出现的事情是历史上没有先例的，所以人们不知道该怎么看它，不知道该怎么样对付它
But however, I think it's understandable for Western societies' active actions, because in my opinion, today what happened in China is new for the world. No one really understand and understand China. No one know how to read China. How to deal with it. How to deal with China. Um, sorry, we have one more question here. I think it's going to be the last. Yeah, here we go. Haruko, sorry. Haruko Watanabe, HKW. Now, 30 years ago, people thought when China became big economic power, there should be a market economy in China. But so far, the party economy is the biggest among those economic power. Do you think uh, that what people thought 30 years ago is uh, just an impossible dream? Or you can still have some kind of market economy in China? It's obviously a tough question, Haruko. Uh, um, 呃，特别是在邓小平九二年南巡讲话之后，那中国确实还是在市场化方向、在私有化方向呃走了很远的步子。Yes, I think after June fourth, um, after 1989, China opened the market and uh, step in the free market society. 嗯，呃，但是呢，当然中国的这种资本主义和其他的资本主义有很确实有很大的不同。嗯，But the China's capitalism is very different from the traditional capitalism. 嗯，在很大程度上，中国就是呃，中国的政府就是就成了资本家，嗯，中国的政府就成了董事会，它的各级官就等于成了CEO，它成了这么一种这么一种形式。China's, uh, China's, when the process of China open market and become um, economic reform is very different from the world. In China, after June 4th, they, they started the economic re, uh, development and the reform. It's just, be, just, you just let the, allow the Chinese Communist Party member Office, Chinese officials become the CEO, become the leader of the company directly. Yeah. Yeah. The Chinese then the Chinese officials and the Chinese party themselves get a lot of profit. From this process, 你像中国现在各界政府，他们从土地的方面得到了大量的财富，就是因为现在中国所有土地的买卖都要经过政府之手，因为中国政府就很容易通过啊用很低的价钱买进很高的价钱卖出去，从中赢得暴利。嗯，
this is the first, last year's 40th anniversary of so-called open reform. And I think there's no reform, not much reform. There's only open. I admit that China open a lot, enter WTO or something. But talking about reform, not much. Um, I think we can take one more question. The lady, uh, did you did you still have your question? My name is Keiko Kandachi at American Embassy in Tokyo. Uh, in your view, who was the worst person uh, responsible for the Tiananmen Square massacre? Uh, Li Pan or uh, Deng Xiaoping was too naive, uh, deceived by the, these people, or who was the most responsible? <laughs> Okay, of course I think it's Deng Xiaoping. At that time, Deng Xiaoping controlled everything. When he decided to try to crack down the student movement, there are a lot of high-level officials against his decision, but when he made his decision, nobody dared to against. So of course, he's the first the first person who should take this, this responsibility. I could say it's the, 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 the bad guy, or, but he... The responsibility should be put on his shoulder. Yeah,对，我我也同意。呃，而且如果我们可以想象，如果当时没有邓小平，呃，而是别的人出到他那个位置，即便他想屠杀，他也做不到，因为他不可能拥有邓小平当时所拥有的那种权威。I agree with Wang Dan. And uh, we can imagine if someone else sit in the position of Deng Xiaoping at that time, he, he cannot make this decision. He cannot crack down such a big movement because he's, he's not have the, that kind of Deng Xiaoping's reputation and the power. And, uh, and uh, um, <clears throat> there are a lot of... I analysis about uh, what's the reason Tiananmen student movement fired. But I, I, as a history major student, I think uh, sometimes maybe history not so complicated. Maybe just very, very simple because Deng Xiaoping is still alive. Imagine if there's no Deng Xiaoping, I don't think Zhao uh, Ziyang will crack down student movement. And I don't think somebody can have this kind of power to crack down all the opposite opinions. So maybe that's the only reason for our failure is uh, there's a point alive. Okay. Um, we do have to finish there. So my uh, final responsibility today is to extend to Mr. Hu and uh, Mr. Dan a one-year uh, complimentary membership for the FCCJ. I already have two. Okay. <laughs> number, number three. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.